when your world is falling apart? Just think about that for a second. Another question. How can your faith grow when you ask God for something specific, which we all do, and he seems to do just the opposite? How is it possible to have a faith that is not tied to the ups and downs of circumstances? So this morning, we're going to discover a biblical faith versus uh, the faith of our culture, which is up and down. There was a song, I think it was in the 80s, may need some help here, uh, by Journey called Don't Stop Believing, 80s or 90s. It's not 70s, so don't... Okay, it's one of the top five songs ever in human history. Okay, and they played it at Red Wing games. The Red Wings used to think it was their song. Now other teams have claimed it. And so, uh, but, but it was about believing, you know, you know, and everybody sings it at parties and bars and stuff. Don't stop believing. Hang on to that feeling. That's what most people think about faith, okay? Don't stop believing. Hang on to that feeling. Bronco fans are saying that today. You know, we're not, we're not going to quit believing. But I want you to know that that is the opposite of biblical faith. And you're going to see, I'll make it as simple as possible. Most people, when they think about faith, they have human emotion. We've got to try harder. Hey, just believe, guys. Just believe. Come on, have some faith. Have some faith. Faith, biblically, is faith in a person who has specific attributes and who reveals himself to be trustworthy. And so we're going to see when the fire's turned up and we'll talk about, wow, chapter 2 to 3, what went wrong, Nebuchadnezzar? Are you out of your mind? This is wild. Let's stand for the Word of God. Okay, now get your knee pads on because there's a lot of Scripture here. I don't know how to cut it out, so I'm going to go, I'm going to go 8 through 30. And the Word of God is the most important thing that could ever be uttered in this place anyway. So let's listen as God speaks to us. Verse 8, Therefore, at that certain time, Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever! You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigen, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Mishrach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. And Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Mishrach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Mishrach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigen, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But, if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to cast them into the burning furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated. The flames of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. But he answered, But but, but I, I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning, fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had, had not any power over the bodies of the, those men. The hair of their heads was not sins. Their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. Any nation, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limbs and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. <clears throat> Three principles this morning. The first you're not going to like. The third is the glory of the gospel. And uh, the first is, it, and it's going to make it real simple for you. If you're serious about pursuing Jesus Christ with all your heart and soul, you can expect severe trials in your life. So please say it's not so. No, it is. There'll be storms. The, the second principle is, the first is expect trials. The second is, you've got to build a biblical faith. If all you do is agree with journey, don't stop believing, hanging out of feeling. You will feel so violated at times by people who say, have more faith, what's wrong with you? When you don't even know what to do when life is falling apart. A biblical faith. And we're going to very briefly continue to build that foundation. And then the third is the glory of the gospel, which is, of course, share in Christ's triumph. Share in Christ's triumph. So we're going to end with the gospel. We're going to end with God's intervention, God's coming, God's protection, God's deliverance. But before we do that, we've got to realize that things happen between chapter 2 and chapter 3 that are not good. When we last left our characters and the story, there had been a great intervention by God. And uh, he had allowed Daniel, his servant, who is, of course, leading the exiles in Babylon, 605 B.C. And Daniel was faced with a hard situation of having to interpret supernaturally the king's dreams. And in it, Daniel not only knew what his dream was, but he articulated the meaning of the dream. And we spoke about the gold and the uh, silver and the bronze and the iron mixed with what? Good. All right. You're awake. And right? And so we saw this incredible vision. And we realized that, you know, Daniel should have been put to death because it indicated that these great kingdoms of the world, Babylon, Media, Persia, or Persia, modern Iran today, Greece, and Rome, that's your iron and clay, which is going to be broken apart by a stone cut out of the what? Begins with an M. Mountain. Thank you. We live in the mountains. I was going to throw that clue out too. It's going to become a huge rock that fills the whole earth. And what does that represent? The kingdom of God. Okay, the growth of God's kingdom. The stone the builders rejected became the cornerstone that fills the whole world. And so Nebuchadnezzar, instead of killing Daniel... What do you mean my kingdom's going to be reduced to dust? He worshipped God because he saw this amazing declaration. Okay, good stuff, right? Nebuchadnezzar's going to go to church from now on. He's going to join the band and be in Brian's Bible study. No. Because the human heart is so rebellious and we have the same kind of heart. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That church service was nice. And yes, I did give my life to Christ. But you know what? I'm not me you're not messing with my kingdom. You're not messing with what I think is important. You know, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, there's a glorious God. I've seen supernatural answer to prayer. I've seen deliverance. There's a whole lot happening in this church. But wait a minute. You're not messing with the core of my life. Now, t multiply that times a thousand. Nebuchadnezzar is not a believer yet. I want you to see that. You see, how do you be a believer in the Old Testament? You look forward to the promises of God that will be fulfilled in Christ. 
Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Nebuchadnezzar is a person that goes to church, I'm using that as a metaphor, and who thinks, wow, great music. Wow, great testimony. Great insight. Great people. But he doesn't know God. And at the very core of his life is his own empire. So, now what he does, we just read that we read part of it, not all of it, in Daniel 3. Instead of saying, I'm going to serve God in everything, he says, I'm going to erect a golden statue to myself. And whenever the music starts playing, everybody's got to bow down to me. What? Man, I, I thought things were going so well. No, that's what the human heart wants apart from God's intervention. I want life to be about me. I want my needs. I want everyone to serve me. As long as I'm doing well, doesn't matter deep down how anyone else is doing. But this time, of course, he's a tyrant. He's got incredible power. Power begets power. And so he issues a mandate, which a lot of the tyrants of the world have done similar things. He says, unless you bow down to me, and declare that I am Lord, you'll be put to death. Now, you may say, where's Daniel in all this? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are the cohorts with Daniel who were brought out as the leaders. And so they're finding themselves facing a difficult situation. Now, just a real quick side note. This is 605 B.C., before the coming of Christ. In the first century, when Christians were fed to the lions... They were not fed to the lions because they talked about Jesus the prophet teaching great stuff. They were not fed to the lions because they had great thoughts on the kingdom of God. They were fed to the lions because they declared one thing. Anybody want to guess? Jesus is what? He's Lord. And why was that a problem? What's the big deal about that? Because if you were a loyal Roman citizen, there could only be one Lord. And you had to say it. Caesar is Lord. So that, that's why Christians were thrown to the line. They want you to see that. It wasn't because they went to nice Bible studies in the temple. And it was because you cannot, in this fallen world, declare Christ to be Lord without having what? Severe consequences. John Piper's book, I mentioned it before, called What Jesus Demands in This World. It's really a tough title, I know. But he's basically saying, you can talk about God, you can talk about all sorts of spiritual things, but the minute you bring the declaration that Jesus Christ is Lord into the secular, secular discussion, people go, whoa, isn't that a little narrow? Isn't that a little too much? What do you mean? that?" And so Piper's book is What Jesus Demands and Will Demand from All Nations, All People, That Every Knee Shall Bow. And every tongue confess. I want you to see that. That's what's happening. Because, you know, you might say as you read this text, what's the big deal? We can just pretend we're in a ballet class and bow down, you know. We can, I don't really believe in this stupid Nebuchadnezzar stuff. I'm not, I don't care about Nebi. I, wanna, I believe in God. But there was something about the significance of bowing down, you see. It was more than just a physical act. So Daniel, remember the whole point of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Try saying that five times fast. We're going to do the best job we can as citizens. We're going to spend our whole life in this city. We're going to pour ourselves into serving this pagan king. And we are going to be the best loyal workers you could ever imagine. But we will not call Nebuchadnezzar God. By the way, that's going to be true of America too. We're going to be the best servants you can imagine in this city. We're going to serve this city. But there are certain times where we're going to say, whoa, I'm not crossing that line because I belong to Jesus Christ. Do you see that? Do you see that? And so when I say expect trials, I, that's just a given. It's like saying if you're going to live in Colorado, you're going to have some wild snowstorms, all right? Now, they're getting it back east right now, and we're going, na 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 but don't worry, our day will come very shortly here. And hey, Washington got how many inches? 25? Good, better them than us. The point being is if you're going to live for Christ, there, and that's a good sign, by the way, there's going to be a storm raging around you, and the fire's going to be turned up. And, fire. and by the way, one other thing, just real quick. If you want to grow in Jesus Christ, and who doesn't? Become more like Christ. Have his character burned in my soul. 
That only happens through the fire. I'm sorry. I, do, I know that's hard. There's no way that the dross of sin and selfishness is going to be burned out of my character apart from the fires of life. It just doesn't work that way. Every bit of growth in my life has come about through severe challenges. Now, we're not going to leave it with point one here because you say, oh boy, I thought the Christian life was joyous. I thought this was incredible. No, yes, it is. But I want you to know, and for this service too, we're going to seek God's heart. There are going to be significant trials. And so Daniel, at this time, couldn't even conform outwardly. Daniel wasn't there. I'm sorry, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they realized there'd be a terrible cost here. One of the great um, statements about Christians in the world, it's often hard to understand it, but we are in the world, but not of the world. Now, you can get all kinds of interpretations of that, but it means we are here for these people in this city. While we're on this earth, we pour ourselves into our culture, but we're also not of the world. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And so I say, if you're serious about Jesus, the winds will blow. And I'm using two metaphors. And the temperature will be turned up in your life. And by the way, when the storms really rage in your life, don't despair because it usually is a sign that God is up to something very special. When things start to fall apart, don't despair. Because God has such an interest in your life, such an investment in your life. He's not just leaving you there to fry, so to speak. He is so committed to you and your growth and what He's doing. It's so much bigger than anything you could ever imagine for your life. When the winds are really blowing, God is up to something special. Okay, second principle. Again, the first is expect trials. You say, oh boy, it's like having to go to the dentist. The second is build a biblical faith. And you know what? I could spend hours on this. I won't. Especially not past 105, huh? Hmm. Brian says, fine. Go ahead. Do it at 205. I dare you. Build a biblical faith. You know, uh, I don't think there's a subject more confusing to people in our city than the subject of faith. I mentioned journey song, but I mentioned... People, they, they'll talk about Bronco faith, too. Have faith, have faith. Yeah, I get it, I get it. And um, I had more faith in you. What happened? Did somebody, what, didn't you guys have any faith? That's why your cousin wasn't healed. You didn't have enough faith. And people are confused. And what is faith? Just revving ourselves up and say, yeah, 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 I've got it. And I've got it. Making my emotions just really supercharged. No, dear friends, that's a man-centered faith. I know you're raising a lot of questions. Well, what is faith? What is? What do I do? What do I do? Brian Chappelle, who's a wonderful preaching professor at Covenant Seminary, and he's written a wonderful commentary on the book of Daniel, and I am borrowing it uh, generously. Um, he, he says, Most evangelical churches describe faith, which would be like an, an evangelical witch. Now, that's strong language, I know. He says, People are so confused about what faith means. And he says, You put a pinch of a song from a good band, you put an ounce of prayer, you put a ton of belief, and you exert it with human will, and you put it into the cauldron of church, and you get enough people revved up, and then you have enough faith. And people, our secular friends that don't really know Jesus, are confused. Well, what does it mean to really believe God? And then you go out to the hard situations of life. You walk the halls of Children's Hospital and you see people that are trying to believe and trying to believe and trying to believe and having faith. And people tell me, if you only believe, if you only believe, and we realize life is a mystery and we're, we're, we're living in a seriously broken world and there are things that we can't control. And all I'm saying to you is a biblical faith focuses on God, not on man. And he said, well, what do we have to do? Well, you've got to get to know him and it's faith in a person, as I will show you right here. Biblical faith means you acknowledge that God is good all the time and sufficient and loving even when my heart is broken and even when it appears that the exact opposite has happened in my life. And I can't understand the reasons, but I've come to know a personal God who has revealed his character to me. And I know that my daddy 
knows what's best. And sometimes I have to walk into a raging furnace and it seems like everything is falling apart. But I trust the character of my God who has claimed me as his own. Now, what's the turning point here? Daniel, and I want Nathan to put it up. Daniel 3.18, please. This is one of the great verses in Scripture. And it is a biblically balanced faith. But if not, if he doesn't deliver me in the furnace, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Here's what he's saying. My God is the God of the universe. He's the ultimate power. <clears throat> my God has ordained the days of my life. My God knows me inside out. But my God is also sovereign. A and here's, here, let's bring it home, okay? And if I don't make it through this surgery, which the whole church is praying for, I know that my God has delivered me ultimately to my home. And he has a reason which can never fully be understood in this life. Now, in terms of the persecution, he's saying, if God does not deliver us from this fiery furnace, and he certainly can, we know the character of our God. If he chooses not to, Nebuchadnezzar, we still will not bow the knee to you. Okay? That's biblical faith. If God doesn't give me that job, it's going to break my heart. If I can't marry this girl, it's going to break my heart even more. And if this cancer doesn't go away, God forbid, if this cancer doesn't go away, I'm going to honor my God. And the reason why is that I know him personally. He's not energy. He's not a cosmic spirit. He's not getting the forces of, 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 the, of, of the energy of Denver together on my behalf and having some white light, that's new age stuff, you know, and passing white light into my situation, getting all the energies and protons and neurons in the universe. No, 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 no. My God is a personal God who knows me inside out. And He alone has my back. Now, let's, let's make it simpler, okay? Little boy, fishing trip. Warmer weather, obviously. Saturday morning. Spring, where there's still storms in other part of the country. Waiting for daddy to come home. Waited all week for daddy to come home. This is a dad who loves his child, and the child knows that. And for some reason, he's late picking him up. And there's no call. Maybe the cell phone went bad. Maybe he didn't get in, and the little boy waits at the door. But this little boy does not wait with despair. He doesn't say, you know, he doesn't care for me. I guess he's going off with some other kid or, is, you know, playing around. He knows the character of his daddy. And he knows, no matter what, there's a reason for the delay. And this daddy has given everything for him. Now, please, don't ever forget this. Whenever you begin to wonder about God's love, remember the Emmanuel principle that he has come for you. And remember the cross that no other God would offer himself up for you so that you can know him. I know some of you might be saying, well, it seems like I've talked to Daddy and it's been a couple months now and I just don't see this resolving. I know it's a fire, it's a furnace. I, mean, I, I want to try to explain God's purpose here. I just want you to know that real faith is in a person. How do you get to know this person? I'm glad you asked. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And the way I know God is through the fire and through His Word and hearing His voice and realizing what He has given for me. Amen? So that's one and two. Expect trials, build a biblical faith. And you're going to be challenged every day of your life. What is a biblical faith? What is a man-centered faith? Now let's revel in the glory of the gospel. And this, of course, is share in Christ's triumph. Triumph? I'm about ready to walk into a furnace. I'm about ready to go into surgery. I may not come out of. What do you mean, triumph? I'm in an emergency room after a terrible accident. What do you mean, triumph? Yes, exactly. That's the word that we are using. 
And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, uh, you know, this is the bottom line. We're going into the fire. May not make it out. And again, it's seven times hotter. That's the biblical word for fullness. This is as hot as you can imagine. This is so hot that the workers who carried him to the fire were sins. They were burned and died. And so once again, the book of Daniel reveals the supernatural intervention of God. And in the midst of it, let me just read it to you. He said, I see four men unbound. They were bound, okay? What happened here? Walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the God. Now, who's saying that? Nebuchadnezzar. He's not, he hadn't gone to Denver Seminary yet. He, this is a pagan king, okay? A son of the gods. There's something supernatural that I'm seeing. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I, it's only been a, a couple of times when things were so horrible when I could just say, he's here. He's here. He's here. I just, and what does that produce? A calmness, a peace, a prayer. It's not even rational to explain it. He's here. He's here. Now, let me get theological with you for a second. Who is this guy in the fire? Throw it out. Don't let Melody answer everything, please. Is he Jay Leno? Is he... Who do you think? Well, Meryl knows this stuff. It's Jesus. He said, wait a minute. Why? Jesus wasn't born yet. Aha, you're being tricky, aren't you? Yeah. Is that, that's not, yeah, he wasn't physically born. He hadn't become incarnate. Those are big words, I know. In the flesh, Jesus is eternal, having always existed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, if, and now I'm going to get theological just for a second with you, and I'll pull back to normal language then. But Christians have always attested to this being a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or a theophonic, big word, vision. Theophany just means an angel appearance of the glory of God. All right? And the angel revealing God. So what it was, it was an appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, similar to Joshua 5. Write that down. When you see the angel of the Lord and the glory, and Joshua overcomes him, whoa, who is this? And we see a picture of the coming deliverance that would come for us in our Savior, Jesus. You say, what is it? A theo what? Theophonic appearance of the glory of Christ. And he's here. Now, I want you to know that if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, no matter what furnace you go in, no matter what terrible trial you endure, how severe a divorce, the Lord Jesus Christ enters in your world in the same way he enters into your life. And the world will say, whoa, how are you getting through this time? And he's the ultimate God who comes for us, to us, and in us. Now, on a lighter level, our whole life is fire. If, you're not, if you don't grow through the fire, you're not going to grow as a Christian. Why? Because we're all so sinful and selfish. I'll speak for myself. I'm way more than you. I, if without the fire of God, the, the image of Jesus in me will never be produced. No. That's Because I'm really like Nebuchadnezzar. By the grace of God, because Christ lived in me, I'm not like that. But you see what I'm saying? I have the same stuff of Nebuchadnezzar. It's about me. That's what all he was saying. Times 1,000. And so here's the miracle of the story. Now, most churches, if you hear this story preached, you'll, you'll hear it in a moralistic fashion. <laughs> Moralism. Hey, you can get through the fire this week. That's the ultimate lesson. You can get through the fire. Hang in there, just like the Broncos do. Hang in there to the end. You'll get through the fire. That's not the message of the text. Do you see that? That's not why God placed that here. What is the message of the text? Jesus Christ went into the fire for you, and he himself 
entered the highest furnace of the universe where there was nobody there to rescue him, nobody there to come for him. Even his own father had turned away from him because he became sin in the furnace of the cross. And as he went into that fire, there was no one there to rescue. And the reason why he went into that fire is so that you'll never have to face the fires alone. And he went into that fire so that the fire of your own sin could be done away with and taken so that you could stand in his presence like you've never committed a sin. And that's the one I have faith in. Do you see the difference? Sure, you'll get through the fires this week, but that's not the meaning of the text. The meaning is that our Savior, goes into the fire of the cross and rescues us from our horrible, self-centered, ugly, sinful heart and gives us a new heart of the glory of God. Do you guys see that? Are you awake enough to see that? And that means when I say have faith in God, I say, well, tell me more about this God. Yeah, my life's a mess, but I'm going to trust Him. This situation hasn't worked out well, but He'll work it out. I, I may not make it through this, but I know my God lives. And so when the heat is turned up, I can trust God because I know Him. And I know He's got your back. And He'll get you through the furnace. And He'll get you home before dark. And not a hair will be burned. And you will say, Oh my goodness, thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the Lord of the furnace that's always there for me. This is the Jesus that you can trust and give your life to. Amen? We are done. So I'm going to pray. And this wonderful band is going to come and play and sing. I'm going to pray. They're going to play. Different words. Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, this is your moment, and uh, we have some real fires in this room. We've got some real uncertainty. We've got some real brokenness, and there's a, we live in the midst of a broken city. That we're always trying to wonder, what do we believe in? How do we get to God? How do we get to God? How can we make things happen? What do, who do we pray to? And, oh, Lord, you come for us, and you reveal yourself to us. and You come as Daddy who's there for us. And Father, it's hard when we're facing ongoing situations. We are tempted to doubt your love. But yet, Lord Jesus Christ, we are face to face with a very different kind of Savior who gave it all for us. So, Father, we don't want to be like Nebuchadnezzar. We don't want to be impressed. We don't want to have like, well, well, this is great. We want to know you. We want to know you in the very depth of our being because we are known by you. And so, Lord Jesus, if there's anyone here this morning who has never or on the, on the Internet given their lives to Christ, and there's a supernatural moment of the Holy Spirit working in your heart, and you know it. It's not me just talking. It's much more than that. Say, Lord, I want to know you. Thank you for walking into the fire of the cross and taking my sin, all of it, and giving me your perfect righteousness, your completed righteousness. I receive you for who you are, and, and in doing so, I receive the very life of God through the Holy Spirit in my soul. And I come alive in Christ. If you have prayed that prayer, you have entered the kingdom of God. And maybe you just have to feel like me. Well, Lord, it's been a rough few weeks. I just need to say I'm sorry. I need, I need to realize I just haven't been seeing clearly. I just, I'm, I'm a mess. I, I need you, Lord. I need you. I'm a Christian, but I, I, I really need you. I need you more than I could ever, ever say. Let's just give that to him today. Maybe you've had to get, maybe you've had to let go of a relationship. It's been so hard. And maybe there's just something nagging at you. And give that over to him today, too. Maybe it's finances. You feel... Like you're just not going to get through. Give that to him too. And we pray it in uh, Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen and amen. Would you please stand for our final song?